Hello and welcome to an episode of On the Couch, where we collaborate with experts, practitioners, authors, advocates and influencers to explore current social themes, sex positive topics and share stories and insights that matter. This podcast was recorded on Aboriginal country. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands that were never ceded on which we live, work and record upon. We pay our respects to elders past and present and to those who may be visiting our website or listening to our podcasts today. While listening, we encourage you to practice good self-care. Check the show notes for content details and references. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, enjoy this episode of On the Couch. Welcome On the Couch with Nurse Nettie. I'd like to acknowledge that we each have our own sex ed and sexual health experiences to reflect on, some positive and some not so positive. And so what we can do is really recognise and acknowledge that and celebrate how far we have come in providing accessible and positive sexual and reproductive health information to young people. When we think about young people and where they find sex and sexual health information, we know that the internet is a go-to place. We also know that there are a lot of misleading and untrustworthy information sources on the internet, which is a concern if a young person is trying to find the information around discharge and the internet tells them that they are dying. So not ideal, and that's not what we're wanting for our young people. So when the Nurse Nanny platform became live on the New South Wales Play Safe website back in March 2014, it really became a safe place for young people to ask those questions that they may not have felt comfortable asking anyone else. Nurse Nettie is a real qualified sexual health nurse based in Sydney, answering questions around bodies, sex, sexual health. It is anonymous and confidential through an online messaging system. And this really helps provide some professional guidance around those conversations around sex, sexual health, reproductive health and bodies. In 2021, Nurse Nettie received 284 email questions. So as the Caddyshack team, we are really excited to reveal one of the people behind Nurse Nettie. Frances Turner has joined us today on the couch. And so I really hope that this is interesting to both hear what the most common questions are that are asked to Nurse Nettie, but also hear how Nurse Nettie responds to those questions in an open and respectful way. Welcome, Fran. Hi, Maddie. Thank you for having me. Very happy to be here. I'm not sure actually whether our audience would be aware, Fran, about the team of sexual health clinicians behind Nurse Nettie. Can you tell us a little bit about that team? Yeah, sure. So um, we've got a team of very experienced nurses. Um, They've all been working in sexual health for some time from a variety of backgrounds. And we all work together to yeah man the phone lines, answer questions, collaborate with other services. And yeah, yeah, we love it. It's fabulous. It's great. It's really a different way of interacting with, um, Mm -hmm. with members of the public. And so can you tell us just to start us off to kind of get an idea of Nurse Nettie, Sure, yeah. So basically the the thing with Nurse Nettie is Nurse Nettie as an avatar is a consistent presence. Um, And so it doesn't matter which nurse is answering Nurse Nettie. Nurse Nettie's persona is pretty much the same. They're very positive, very sex positive, very encouraging, which, you know, we as individuals all are hopefully as well. Nurse Nettie just provides a more consistent presence. And I think that's particularly important for maybe younger members who, who feel like they're talking to the same person, particularly if they have follow-up questions, but sometimes they do, they don't necessarily want to be talking to different people. Yeah, it's like one of those things, right, when you call up and you have to explain your whole story again from scratch, and so sometimes online is better. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So we try and really maintain that consistent persona with Nurse Nettie, just down to tone of voice, um, you know, the, the kind of language that we use, that kind of thing. We're also very careful to be mindful of health literacy Mm -hmm. so we always try to aim the reading age of the answers that we provide to someone who is around the age of you know 10 years old Um, and that's just because we are conscious of the fact that you know people people have differing cognitive abilities or different reading abilities or different levels of health literacy so we try and keep it towards that end just to make it more accessible for people yeah yeah and I guess that the online platform removes that barrier in terms of confidence to be able to ask 
your question over the phone. I feel as though even when I was younger, I would write down my question. Okay, so hi, this is who I am. This is what my question is, mm-hmm. you know, regardless yeah. of what it's about. But it's that confidence, isn't it? And being able to have time yeah. to t- yeah. type that up. Mm. totally yeah and I mean I don't know about you but my personal experience of sex ed in school is we had this thing where you know there was a box and you could write your anonymous question yeah. and put it in kind of thing and that's kind of the concept of this yeah. I would say yeah it's the good old question box that comes yeah. out <laughs> the online question box. Mm. we know that it's confidential and anonymous but can you tell us about the level of detail that is required for this type of platform Yeah. Yeah. So it's really important um, that we do have a way to reply to you. So we need your email um, and ideally um, just double check that you've put it in correctly because otherwise we're not going to be able to respond to you, unfortunately. Um, In terms of your age, we just ask that in terms of, you know, safeguarding reasons, I suppose, and also to ensure that we're providing an appropriate level of information. So for instance, the information that I provide to a 25 year old would maybe be slightly different to the information I supply to a 15 year old and it's really good for us to be aware of that and 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 figure out the most appropriate resources to signpost people to as well postcode everybody seems a little bit anxious about the only reason we do that is because we do get some people from out of new south wales so other states and even from overseas we've had um, questions Mm -hmm. from america and in those kind of scenarios it's really tricky for us because we kind of go well we're actually not as familiar with your location and what's available to you so in those instances we usually respond to people saying you know this is actually your nearest sexual health service we actually yeah. recommend you go and ask them because we're not familiar with your area so yeah. that's the only reason we ask for postcode gender is really helpful because we like to know how to refer to you we like to know your pronouns we like to know a little bit more about about again making it yeah. personable as an answer for you if we don't know that we can give you information but we like to personalize it as much as we possibly can rather than just giving a blanket dry textbook yes. answers so yeah. just helps us a little bit as well yeah. and good to see that there's um options there yeah absolutely yep yep how much detail do you usually get oh it varies yeah, um, yeah so there's there's times where people will ask us questions and, and we actually have to go back and say like you know you need to give me a little bit more detail than that I'm not really yes. sure what you're asking because yes. again when we train our nurses to work on nurse netty one of the the core rules of being nurse netty is did you answer their question? Mm -hmm. And that's harder than it sounds because Mm -hmm. sometimes you can get really, if someone's written you a paragraph, it's really easy to get bogged down and actually lose sight of what their original question was. So Mm -hmm. sometimes we have to write back to people and say, you know, actually, could you give me a little bit more information? Sometimes we get a lot of information and that's not a bad thing. Um, But what we ask people to remember is we can't diagnose you over the internet, unfortunately. So we're very happy to provide information and tell you where you should go and give you answers and all that kind of thing. But often, you know, we may get people saying, you know, I've had these spots, they've been there for this long. And what do you think they could be? And in that case, our answer will always be, you need to go to a clinic. Would you like me to help you find where to go? Because we can't diagnose you online. So. Yeah, and the good thing I guess about PlaySafe is it has that find your nearest sexual health yes. clinic function on here. So mm, really absolutely, fun. and that's where PlaySafe is actually really helpful because often, sometimes when we get asked questions, we go, "PlaySafe has actually written this great article or this great mm-hmm. blog post. Here it is. Here's the link." And mm-hmm. so often we can take what PlaySafe has already done and yeah, provide that back yeah. to them. Yeah, and all of those blog posts to come through you or through the nurse any team don't they to be able to fact check those and everything that's going on play safe is yeah always checked by the sexual health clinicians Absolutely. so we know, we know it's trustworthy and, and reliable information right mm-hmm. yeah, yeah definitely <laughs> i'm wanting to provide a bit of a glimpse behind the scenes so what actually mm. happens when a young person or, or you know a, a youth worker asks their question and it comes through to you is it on a on a shared inbox how do you decide who responds to that question what is the process when someone submits that question yeah sure so every day someone is responsible for checking the inbox so it is a shared inbox that the questions all come to and um, we make sure that yep someone is aware that straight away at nine o'clock which is when we start someone's checking the inbox throughout the day to make sure there's any questions Um, and uh, that person is responsible for answering the questions as well 
However, we check in with each other as nurses sometimes, because sometimes we get something a little bit tricky or we kind of go, oh, is that the best way to phrase it? Or have I used the best resource? And often we'll talk to each other and say, you know, hey, how would you answer this? Because this is what I've put, but what do you think? And they range from being very straightforward to being slightly more complex. So we'll sometimes check in with each other. So that's the nuts and bolts of it, really. We do our best to answer all questions within 24 hours. If there's ever going to be a delay, we will usually reply with an email going, just so you know, we're really busy at the moment. Sorry, we, 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 are, we have received your email. We'll get back to you. And, you know, because the service does only run Monday to Friday, if there's, if there's weekends or holidays, there's always a bit of a lag as well. But we do aim to get back as quickly as we can. Yeah, and I love that too, because I can imagine it would be such a big thing to ask you a question and then not know whether, like, have you got it? Has it gotten mm. lost? Has it gone to junk? I'm not hearing from them. So to mm. be able to hear back and say, yes, we've got your question, you know, mm. Nurse Nettie's going to get back to you. It's mm. reassuring. Absolutely. Yeah. Sometimes, depending on the question that someone's asked us, we actually might ask them to call us. And this is usually when the question has a lot of layers to it. And we actually say, do you know what? It would actually be better if we had this conversation on the phone, if you're comfortable to. Mm -hmm. And so then what we'll, we'll say is generally we'll reply to the young person and say, look, this is confidential still. You can still call the shill line, sexual health info link. But a nurse would just prefer to talk to you because otherwise I'm going to be writing you an essay pretty yes. much. And yeah. it's probably going to leave you with more questions and answers. So sometimes we will reply to the young person and say, hey, would you mind giving as a call you know we're happy to talk to you mm, yeah and can you talk more about you know that that tone of voice that you touched on earlier and that type of language I'm guessing there's guidelines and kind of yes. a standard response behind that yeah, there is. Absolutely. So, you know, we, we try to make Nurse Nettie, as I said, very encouraging, very positive. So we always start an answer with thank you for your question. And, you know, we do a lot of positive reinforcement in that, you know, say, for example, if someone's got questions about their anatomy or how they negotiate condoms or all that kind of stuff, we just say, you know, good on you for you know, wanting to use condoms, that's really great. You know, it's, it's great that you're thinking about how to best protect yourselves and your partners. And we try to keep that positive tone throughout. We definitely don't want to put across anything that's going to seem like sex is shameful or dirty. You know, sex is a beautiful, wonderful thing. And the main thing is to make sure that you and your partners are safe. And the fact that you're asking me this question means that you want to do those things. So good on you. We'll always try and be encouraging of them to engage in healthcare where possible. So where we do a lot of advocate, advocating in terms of, you know, we really try to encourage people to have those conversations with their parents or with their partners and just saying, look, no, these are people who care about you. They want the best for you. And, you know, have you thought about how you could have that? So we're very much kind of trying to facilitate those yeah. conversations with partners, parents or trusted guardians or, or whatever. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, and I can hear that really inclusive language as well, even saying things like partners rather than making the assumption that you've just got one partner or or the um, sexuality um, and gender diversity of the young people who are asking those questions. So I can see how that's important too. Yeah, very much. So, I mean, like I said, we're all experienced sexual health nurses who've worked with the um, LGBTQ plus community for a long mm -hmm. time. You know, some of our staff members are LGBTQ plus themselves. Yeah. Um, and it's that's the beautiful thing, I think, about sexual health is everyone who yeah. works in sexual health is so passionate about those things. And our vision is very much that um you know, the Nurse Netty forum and, and the Nurse Netty emails are somewhere where you can be your authentic, true self mm -hmm. and not worry about any judgment or any assumptions being made. We try very, very hard to say, you know, anything that is between two consenting, you know, people yeah. or more, then good on you, crack on. So, you know, and it's just about how we, how we keep it safe. Totally. Love that. Love that. And so... Around those types of questions, you know, talking about condom use and consent. Also, I know just from previous conversations with you before you've talked about, you know, is my body normal type mm. questions. You know, what are those big themes, those big common themes that you usually get asked? Yeah, so a lot of it, well, you know, we do get a lot of am, am I normal? Is this yeah. normal? Is that normal kind of thing? And, and we kind of go throw normal out the window yeah, because cool. you don't, we don't like the word normal <laughs> yes, for one yes. um I guess what we say is is more you know 
is is it causing you any discomfort is it causing you any distress if so tell us about that why is it you know but we we very much promote some wonderful resources so i know particularly for you know people with vaginas i tend to send them a resource called the labia library for instance which shows yeah. that there are all different kinds of sizes and shapes of labia some have hair some don't and you know they're all fully functioning perfectly fine labias that are, are normal you know and I guess we just try and encourage that and are very mindful of saying to people you know what you see in magazines and porn and videos Mm. actually is a product it's being sold to people right and and a lot of the time that's presented in a certain way because it's thought that that's what people want but true Mm. reality isn't like that and you know you would actually be surprised if you had a look at some of the resources like labia library and saw you are actually more normal than you know. You are more within the the bracket of of yeah. what is considered to be. Um, yeah, I can't. I can't. I can't. I say yeah. I hate the word normal, and I can't I stop know. using it. But you know, know. you know what I mean. So you know, we get questions about penis size, and again, it's more about having communication with your partner and you know, meaningful, enjoyable sex than the size of your penis. It really, genuinely is, and. And what, again, what you see is very much people who have been chosen to present themselves in a certain way because they happen to have a large penis, but actually not everybody does and that's okay. And so, yeah. It's that body positivity and that, you know, building your self-esteem and totally. Yeah. Which is so important. Talking about, you know, your sexual relationships. Yeah. Totally. Totally. Yeah. My mind was going so many different places. I know I, I could talk about that all day. Don't even yeah get me started on, you know. And it's it's funny because it's I was on my own Instagram recently, yeah. and because of some of the pages I follow, it's like I follow Play Safe and stuff yes. like that. I and sometimes get, right? yeah, 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 and and Caddyshack, of course. Yes. And so I sometimes get some some you know because of algorithms and stuff, certain mm. ads pop up, and it's things like I mean I kid you not, I've seen things like. Um, glitter pessaries to put inside your vagina to make your discharge prettier and glittery I've seen things like and the other thing that horrified me recently marketed at young women were non-medical pessaries to lubricate your vagina for sex Mm -hmm. and I'm like unless it's for a medical reason Mm -hmm. it means you're not aroused and if you're not aroused Mm -hmm. are you enjoying it and if you're not enjoying it well (laughs) why why would you do it you know so do you not have access to lube because yeah because yeah actually yeah <laughs> and it's to help if that is a if that is a issue for you yeah absolutely yeah. and it's it's just it's it's bonkers and yes yeah, so don't get me started on femme fresh either otherwise we'll be here all day so <laughs> <laughs> we'll move right on from femme fresh <laughs> and I think too you know it's it's that consistent sexual health messaging but what I really hear from you is that you're linking in and and providing those pathways to those other trustworthy sites outside of I guess New South Wales health Mm. you know what other places do you you know direct young people to so we tend to do a lot of directing outside of PlaySafe and Caddyshack and those kind of partners that we're familiar with we do a lot of directing towards the sexual health clinics themselves and saying you know sexual health clinics are designed to be safe, welcoming spaces. Mm. We do do a lot of directing to GPs as well and kind of encourage young people because a lot of young people don't know they can get their own Medicare card at 15, right? Mm. And we do a lot of facilitating around, well, did you know you can hop online and there's a whole thing and it'll show you how to do Mm. it and all this kind of thing. We do a lot of directing towards counselling services. There's a fabulous New Zealand website that we send a lot of our Uh, question ask us to regarding herpes and that's herpes.org.nz which is wonderful if no Mm -hmm. one's ever seen it I strongly recommend you check it out and yeah and again a lot of um, LGBTQ resources as well so we have a referral manual which we tell a lot of our healthcare professionals about so on the shell website when you go on there's actually a section for a referral manual and it's it's organized by concern essentially Mm -hmm. and so anyone can go in there and find trusted recommended resources and that might be for you know drug and alcohol use it might be you know for sexual dysfunction any range of things Um, but they're resources that we have said you know 
these are reliable, accurate resources that we're kind of happy to endorse and put in our referral manual. Mm. Have at it, go look at it and see what you think would be good for your patients or for yourself or for your loved ones. It's kind of nice to have a nurse Nettie and and your team really be able to say, we've verified these websites and this is where you can find that trustworthy, reliable, accurate information. Mm. It's consistent with what we're saying as well because my gosh, Google, like there would just be so many things that pop up when you type in herpes and and you wouldn't necessarily think of a New Zealand website to go to. So great that that, that's there. Yeah, yeah. I want to move on to get to those top 10 questions that Nurse Andy have been asked. There is a question that came through from our audience. So I'm wanting to make sure we get to that one first. The question is, is it common slash possible for women who have sex with women to get a UTI from having sex like heterosexual couples? Yeah, sure. So that's a great question. It's absolutely possible because all a UTI or a urinary tract infection is, is essentially bacteria entering the tube where you pee from. So your urethra. Much more common in people who have a vagina because our urethras are shorter. So the distance between that tube to our bladder is a lot shorter than people with a penis because their tube is significantly longer. And so usually bacteria doesn't have time to reach the bladder Um, It kind of dies off before it reaches the bladder and can cause any infection or any problems. Um, So for women who have sex with women, um, bacteria can be introduced through sex, certainly. And so, yeah, it is still possible. One of the good ways you can mitigate UTIs that I always say is go for a pee after you've had sex, which sounds very odd and basic, but literally just helps clear the urethra out afterwards. And it sounds like an old wives tale as well, but it's, it's true. It is true. And the other thing, again, that might sound very obvious, but people don't always know is that you should be wiping front to back. Mm -hmm. And the reason you want to do that is because you want to go away from the urethra, because if you wipe back to front, then you're potentially introducing bacteria from your vagina or from your bottom. Mm. Um, into your urethra and you're more likely to get a UTI that way so Mm. go for a pee after you have sex wipe front to back and usually that helps prevent a lot of UTIs but sometimes they will happen and if you so if you notice any stinging sensations if you get any you know kind of discomfort where your bladder is if you find like you're going a lot more often than you used to or you want to go but when you go nothing's coming out means you might have a UTI so it's a good idea to go and get it checked out. Yeah, and I guess one of those things too that, you know, we've had young people say to us those myths, those sexual health myths that, oh, if I do a wee after I have sex, I won't get pregnant. Mm. If I do a wee after I have sex, I won't get an STI. So Mm. I guess that's part of that answer too, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and it's a balancing act, right? Because (laughs) and, And we have to be very careful about that because those little myths, I think, always have some nugget of somewhere it's come from something that may have had some accuracy at some point in time but yes so we do have to be very careful to kind of say when we give advice such as that please be aware this won't prevent pregnancy or STIs you need Mm. to use a condom or contraception for that so we always kind of have that caveat in place and as well using condoms Mm. on sex toys which again is great advice absolutely using Mm. condoms on sex toys making sure you clean your sex toys thoroughly as well is a great way of preventing them also yeah and I think that was a really good example around how Nurse Nettie would answer a question like that and we could see the open and respectful way but yeah I guess recognizing that people who are working with young people they can actually call the sexual health info link can't they totally yeah so when you call sexual health info link what you'll actually hear is please press one if you're a healthcare professional so that's your use care workers community workers all that kind of thing or you know hold on the line if you're a member of the public and the reason we do that is because we want to know with our healthcare professionals obviously you're calling on behalf of someone else because it actually shows up on our screen Mm -hmm. and we've had people call us before so I'll give you a really good example that I had recently is a youth worker that said to me well I've got a 15 year old asking me for condoms what do I do and I said well my advice would be if that young person is coming to you for help number one if we don't help them they're not going to ask us for help again so it's really important that we help them now because if we don't they're not going to trust us they're not going to come to us in future and we want them to we want them to know that they can come to us when they've got a problem or a question or whatever number two if this person's asking you for condoms they're either already having sex or they're thinking about having sex and what we know is that telling people to be abstinent does not work it doesn't it 
Mm. just doesn't and so my concern would be is is that young person going to have sex whether they have the condoms or not and if the answer is yes they're going to have sex no matter what well give them the damn condoms because Mm -hmm. what would be the worst thing is if they got an STI got pregnant if they're capable of childbearing we don't want that to happen but sometimes you know if you don't come from a sexual health background that can be a really scary thing like oh you know is this out of my scope should I be doing this and we're kind of like there to go yes you absolutely should you're doing the right thing give them the condoms off they go and if they use them and they have sex great if they don't have sex well at least they've got them for when they do and so great to have that reassurance from your team yeah the youth workers are great I mean very often they've already made the right decision they just want to talk it through and debrief with someone and just kind of go yeah should I have done anything differently and a lot of the time we're going no you did great well done like that's fabulous yeah yeah I think that's really important especially when we're having these conversations around those most common sexual health questions I've tried to group them together rather than go one to ten Interestingly, five of the top 10 questions around STI testing. So the first question around STI testing, number one, how often should I get an STI test? Number two is, is STI testing expensive? Number three, is an STI test anonymous? And number seven out of 10 is, do I need an STI test even if I have no symptoms? So Really interesting that five out of 10 are around Mm. STI testing, which is really great to know that young people are actually asking these questions to Nurse Nettie. How do you answer those questions around STI testing? Yeah, so again, you know, we would always say, you know, thanks for asking a question. That's great. And one of the things we would always say to anybody, you know, is there there anything in particular that you're worried about that's making you want an STI test, first of all? But again, we would go back to, okay, well, how often you have an STI test? It really depends. So we would say at least once every six months is a good idea, depending on how sexually active you are. Mm -hmm. Um, If you were MSM, the guidelines actually recommend it once every three months. But again, depending on the kind of sex you're having and with who and all that kind of thing. And MSM meaning men who oh, have sex. Sorry, men who have sex with men. Yes. So, yeah. And the reason we use that term is because not all men who have sex with men identify as gay or bisexual. So men who have sex with men encompasses everybody, which is why we use yes. that. And then we use women who have sex with women as well. Okay. So we would always say, look, every every six months at least is a good idea or when you've had a change in sexual partner or if you're showing some symptoms. Do I need an STI test even when I don't have symptoms? Yes, you do, because chlamydia, we know it can present it as asymptomatic a lot of the time. So can other STIs. And one thing they always want to know is, well, my partner's tested negative, so I should be okay, right? And we're going, no, yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. And the way I phrase that to people is going, well, it's kind of like COVID, right? You can be exposed to COVID and not catch it. So your partner could have been exposed to chlamydia and not caught it, and they've been exposed by you who does have chlamydia. So you need yeah. to go and get yourself tested just to make sure. Yeah. In terms of STI testing being expensive, we always go, no, you know, great news is STI testing is free. You know, here's where you can go. And this is why we like to have the postcode because we can say this is your nearest clinic if they don't give us their postcode we've got a really great list of all the different clinics in New South Wales they can go to so we'll just send them a little link and say they can find your nearest clinic here Mm -hmm. it also lists all the Aboriginal medical services on there as well if they prefer to go to those locations too what we always say to people is anonymous is different to confidential so is it anonymous no it's not because you have to give us a name and a contact detail because it's a medical test we need to be able to notify you you can't just drop off a urine sample and not give us any date of birth name or mobile number but what we can say is that it's confidential sometimes it's necessary to share your information say for example if you're going somewhere else to get treated by a gp for instance but we would never share your information without asking you first we would always check with you first that it's okay we certainly don't go and disclose your results to anyone else so yeah and anonymous and confidential are slightly different and we try and clear up that myth a little bit as well yeah, yeah and good opportunity to be able to do that too. Mm, yeah before we move on I was wanting to know how you manage calls when you are concerned about a young person's safety and what are the processes if the person doesn't follow up with you that's a great question and it's 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 a 
tricky scenario to be honest with you because mm -hmm. we have limited information as you can see from the nurse netty we don't have an awful lot to go on the first thing we try to do is is not to scare the young person off um we don't want them to think that they're in trouble or that they've done anything wrong or um you know anything like that so we gently try and coax a little bit more information out of them often that's one of the scenarios where we'll say look it would be really great if you could call us we'd love to chat to you properly kind of thing and we try and encourage them but at the same time what we want to do is we don't want to not answer their question because if they disengage at that point they've gone away without that information mm -hmm. so we still try and supply them with the information so um i had a, a young person ask me recently well how do i talk to my parents about if i'm pregnant and to that we kind of said look you know we'd really like to talk to you but however you know these are some resources on how you would maybe do that but are you even sure that you're pregnant because you mm -hmm. need to do a test first and this is how you do a test and this is how long you have to wait and all this kind of stuff mm. in terms of safeguarding concerns we're very lucky to have uh, a great relationship with the child protection units and so what we would usually do is where possible if we know the person's postcode we can contact the child protection unit within that local health district but if we don't, then we contact the one within Southeastern Sydney, because that's where we're based. Okay. And we would contact them and say, look, this is the story. This is what we've done. We've opened a case file. We've recorded all these details. We've got a plan in place. We're going to try and follow up with them. Do you have any other suggestions for what we would do? And then child protection can kind of say, yeah, do you know what? You need to do an MRG. You need to, and MRGs are hard because, again, we have limited information. Uh, mandatory reporting guidelines mm -hmm. for anyone who's yes. wondering. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it's, a, it's a, re a mandatory report we do when we're concerned about a young person. Mm -hmm. So what we'll do often is we'll we'll create a file in a shared place that all staff can see. All staff will be made aware that we've had a nurse netty caller or a question asker who we're worried about and just saying, hey, if this person makes contact again, this is the plan. This is what we're going to do. We will attempt to re-engage them a couple of times if they drop off, but we also don't want to hassle them or harass mm -hmm. them. We want them to feel like they can come back to us. Mm -hmm. So we will kind of send them a follow-up email just going, hey, I just went to check in. You know, you asked us a question the other day and how are you going? You know, did you manage yeah. to get to the doctor? Did you manage to do your pregnancy test? Yeah. And sometimes they'll respond and sometimes they won't. And that's where it's hard because mm -hmm. there's not an awful lot we can do mm -hmm. except just be open and be there for that young person and just say, you know, just want to say I'm still here if you need me, you know, call us anytime, happy to chat, mm -hmm. you know, and all this kind of stuff. And yeah, it's a tricky one. Yeah, yeah. The great thing about that is that they know where to find you. Yeah. And they know they had a good experience the first time they spoke yeah. to you and, you know, you actually answered their question as well as giving them an opportunity to have that mm. phone call to find more information because if you're not answering my question I'm going to go find someone else who, get, who will right like <laughs> yeah and I mean the thing is I think that frustrates me quite a lot sometimes when you see how people interact with young people young people aren't stupid they're no. not dumb no like, don't try and pull the wool over their eyes because they'll, they'll snuff you out they straight away you. absolutely okay thanks Fran, I will jump into our next theme of questions that I've grouped together around SDI still in the top 10 questions. We've got number eight is how reliable are condoms as a contraceptive and as a protection against STIs? And number 10 is can you get an STI from a hand job? So questions around STIs still and yeah. interesting ones too. Yeah. So, and the, the thing about both of those questions are, it depends. Yeah. <laughs> so, and it's not a straightforward black and white yes or no question. Yeah. So the thing that we say about condoms is condoms are great. They're fantastic because they're the only thing that will protect you from both pregnancy and STIs at the same time. Mm -hmm. However, like everything in life, if you use it the way it's meant to be intended, it will work. If you don't, it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. So we kind of answer that by going, you know, they're, they're really effective, provided are you squeezing the air out of the tip? Are you rolling them down the right way? You know, is it inside out? Yeah. You know, make sure that your nails aren't ragged or anything. Make sure your jewelry isn't getting snagged mm -hmm. on it. Don't try and rip the wrapper with your teeth. You may think you're looking sexy, but, you know, it's actually yes. you're at risk of tearing the condom. Use lubricant because if you don't, then, you know, may you break if it slips or comes off. Don't just put the old one back on. You need to get mm. a new one and all that kind of stuff. So that question we center more around how you're using the condom. Mm. And also 
you know, you could put a condom on halfway through sex and technically be using a condom, but that's very different to putting it on right from the beginning. Yeah. And so we kind of have that conversation with people yeah. as well. And signposting them to some play safe resources on condoms too. Mm. And, and again, just reinforcing it with that positive, you know, it's great that you're either using condoms or thinking about using condoms. Mm. Here's where you can get them from, all those kinds of things. And yeah, just to, again, go good on you for taking responsibility yeah. in doing this. Yeah. In terms of getting an STI from a hand job, what we would say to that is um, it depends on if you've got someone's um, semen or vaginal fluid on your hands and you're then touching yourself, possibly. I mean, it's on the lower risk of the spectrum, but low yeah. risk isn't no risk. So if there's any doubt in your mind and you're worried, just go and get a check. It's, it's yeah. fine. No one's going to yell at you. No one's going to say you've wasted their time or anything like yes. that. Yeah, that's but, point. you know, so <laughs> it's not this this secret club that you've got another password to get in or anything. If you want an STI test, go and get an STI yeah. test. Yeah. Um, but again, what we say to people is, yeah, you know, if you're going to, you know, engage in any kind of mutual masturbation or play, really good to wash your hands before and after, you know, if you've made contact with someone else's fluids, don't be necessarily be touching yourselves. Mm -hmm. um, if you're using toys, again, use condoms or wash them. And sharing of toys and all of those sharing things. Sharing of toys, yeah. all those yeah. kinds of things, yeah. Um, how regularly do you get questions around PrEP? Yeah, we get questions around PrEP quite a lot, actually. Okay. And again, we are very conscious of not discouraging young people because there is, I know, a little bit of... Mm concern sometimes about young people accessing PrEP but also it's at the same vein right if this young person is asking about PrEP that means they think they're at risk if they think they're at risk they probably are and so yeah. we need to have the conversation and it may not be that they're at risk now but they want to know for future mm -hmm. do you know what I mean for so a friend <laughs> or a friend or a friend yeah what a good friend you are fabulous yes. yeah. um but yeah so we and again there's no there's no restriction on information right if they want the information we'll give it to them we would rather them get it from us than go to to an unreliable source so mm. no we get we get questions yeah. quite a lot yeah and also good on that young person to know what prep is and wanting to learn more about it even if it's not right for them right now maybe yeah. it'll be right for them down the track or it's for a friend like actually yeah, for a friend. yeah. <laughs> and I mean things things are getting better for LGBTQ plus youth but there's still mm. a significant gap right yeah. LGBTQ plus youth don't get the same access to sex education that their heteronormative peers do and so they have to work really hard to go and find these answers for themselves, yeah. which is really, you know, yeah, yeah. It sucks kind of thing. Yeah. So if they do, we're not going to go, oh, you're too young to know that. So it's all about empowering them and saying, yep, here you go. This is what you need to know. Yeah, love that. Love that. Uh, okay, so we also have a, questions in here. Number five on the, on the top 10 is when do I need to get a pap smear? Ah, beautiful and question. And using the words pap smear too. <laughs> so the technical new term for a pap smear because the testing changed a little while ago is a cervical screen and one thing I'm very vocal about is even if you are not female presenting or female identifying if you have a cervix you still need to get your pap smear mm -hmm. and it's great to call us if you're not sure about where to go as a, a non-female identifying person mm -hmm. because you might go oh I don't want to go and yeah. have to explain myself in a non-friendly space and we can kind of go we got you. This is where you go. Yes. So to answer the question, most people get their start to get their cervical screens at 25, purely because the research tells us that this is when cervical cancers start to be potentially detected. It's mm -hmm. rare that we see them in people younger than that. Mm -hmm. There are caveats to that though. So sometimes if you're, you had early, what we call early sexual debut. So if your first sexual encounter, consensual or otherwise was under the age of 14, which mm -hmm. does sometimes happen, you should be getting them earlier. If your mother was on a medication called, I, I can't say in full, I'm so sorry, because it's about 50 syllables, but it's called DFES. You should get it earlier as well. And if there's a particular prevalence of cervical cancer in your family, then you should consider getting one done earlier as well. Yeah. And for it to be number five, I'm actually really surprised that it's actually so high in the top 10 questions. Mm, number five. Mm, yeah. Mm. 
Okay, so the last three questions, I guess, are around that am I normal and looking more around sex and those concerns. Number nine is how can I manage premature ejaculation? Number mm -hmm. six, I've lost my libido. How can I get it back? And number four, my partner can't climax anymore. Is this my fault? And I love that these three questions are included in the top 10 because mm. it's, it's looking at sexual health so much more than just STIs and condoms, right? Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Which is what we tend to say to young people, right? Is don't get an STI and don't get pregnant. And yeah. there's so much more so than much that. More than that. <laughs> <laughs> this goes way beyond that. Yeah. So premature ejaculation is an interesting one because mm. I always say to people, well, what? what do you mean by premature ejaculation? Mm -hmm. Because actually what you consider premature ejaculation actually might not be. Might not so be. tell me, tell me yeah. a little bit more about that. What, what do you mean by premature ejaculation? Mm -hmm. And often it's a case of reassuring young people and going, actually, that's not premature ejaculation. You're perfectly normal. Again, yes. you know, porn. Yes. D don't pay any mind to it. And actually I can guarantee you, your sexual partner probably doesn't want to keep going for two hours straight yeah. you know they're probably looking at the ceiling at that point going I'm missing my Netflix show <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's a lot of time just saying that actually what you're describing as premature ejaculation isn't but did you know that sex doesn't just encompass actual penetration and intercourse yeah. it encompasses foreplay and all the things that lead up to it and beyond it as well so so actually don't just think of it in terms of this the moment your penis enters an orifice to mm to ejaculation because that's not the only thing that plays in there yeah. if they were genuinely having issues with premature ejaculation then we kind of go okay well look there, there are services you can go to you know sometimes it's a psychological thing sometimes mm -hmm. it's a biological thing so you need to see a specialist in that area to help you figure out which is which mm -hmm. and once they do that they can help you go okay right well if it's a psychological thing let's talk about some techniques you can use some you know it might be cognitive behavioral therapy or something mm -hmm. like that that will help if mm -hmm. it's a biological cause then certainly you need to be referred to a specialist but mm -hmm. I would say look the vast majority of times it's a misconception of what premature ejaculation actually is yeah so. and I love how you can kind of weave in those conversations and what an opportunity to weave in those conversations around mm. that sex isn't penis in vagina you know that heteronormative but also sex is more than just penetration <laughs> Totally, totally. And, and, such a, and such a great opportunity to mm. uh, talk about that. So how would you then answer the lost libido? Sure, question? sure. So again, I guess we would want to know was, well, what was it like before? And how long ago was that? And how old are you now? And has anything changed? You know, are you really stressed at the moment? Has anything big happened in your life recently? Mm. Have you started any new medications? So for example, a lot of anti-anxiety and antidepressants can cause mm. low libido. And I guess what we kind of say is, is that it's dependent on the cause, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's, it's because the person actually doesn't feel like having sex when their partner wants to have sex. And it's mm -hmm. kind of going, well, it's not that your libido's lost. It's just that your libido's different. Mm -hmm. So you shouldn't feel like you should be having sex just because your partner wants to have sex. It doesn't mean you've got a low libido necessarily. It just means that you're going, no, I'm not in the mood just yeah. on this occasion but the rest of the time I am and so again yeah. it's weaving yeah. and having those conversations about mm -hmm. it and if it's if it's determined to be something that is caused by say medication or stress we then say right let's signpost you to the right place to help you with that maybe you need to go back to your GP and say mm -hmm. look this is happening with the you know I don't know the citalopram I'm taking for my anxiety let me look at how you know we can maybe combat that you know or if you're having a lot of stress in your life let's go well how do you cope with stress and what does that look like for you and you know what what do you enjoy doing that can help lessen your stress let's talk about that kind of thing so yeah, yeah. And I guess also bringing in sex therapy and talking about pleasure and desire which often gets lost in those questions mm -hmm. so the last question we've got is number four um, my partner can't climax anymore. Is it my fault? And I think that is just such an interesting There's a lot to unpack question. there, yeah, right? There? So, yeah. I mean, in, in that scenario, I would say, look, first of all, you're obviously a very considerate person to be concerned with your partner's pleasure and not just mm -hmm. your own. So mm -hmm. it's wonderful that you're thinking of them. When we say, is it not, is it not my fault anymore? The short answer is no. 
No, yeah. not necessarily. Have you talked to your partner? Because again, what's going on for them? Is it again that they're particularly stressed? Have they got a lot going on in their lives at the moment? Because sometimes when we've got a lot of stress going on in our lives, the last thing we feel like doing is having sex. Yeah. And so that's where we really encourage open conversations with your partner. Have you talked to them? What do they say? Mm -hmm. Because they may be feeling really self-conscious about it. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a bit of a minefield that people try to avoid sometimes. So what we would do is encourage that open conversation with your partner, have a discussion with them. Where are they at? What are they feeling? And take it from there really, again, mm -hmm. depending on the answer. Yeah. And I love that the one of you know the big themes in that answer is around communication which is super important and so also important. where you're having that communication it's not in the bed you know mm. just before you're going to be having <laughs> sex maybe not yeah. the best time to be having yeah. sex. why didn't you climax <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> um but yeah super it's great to hear those answers and those questions but also how nurse Nettie would answer mm. them and and I can hear you know that open and respectful responses those inclusive responses but also the whole listen to your body and all of those themes was just really great thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your your knowledge but also I guess your energy around like you can really feel the passion that you have for this project and the team that you have behind you and it was really great to hear a little bit of that behind the scenes glimpse of Nurse Nettie and to know that it is a real person they are real people mm. behind behind this online platform which is just so cool Thanks for listening to On The Couch. We create this podcast because we are allies in actively challenging discrimination, microaggressions and exclusionary behaviours. We want to create spaces where people feel safe to share their thoughts, knowing they will be heard and respected. Such an environment fosters collaboration, innovation and contributes to a more inclusive society. Connect with us on Instagram and Facebook where you can share On The Couch with your colleagues, friends and family. On the Couch is made by Jennifer Farinella, Naomi Verrett, Maddie Stratton and Winnie Adamson. Until next time, peace, love and protection.